All right. So, never have my Socratic going, do I? Today we are going to be working on mammals. Long, hard road. Our very last class, right? So obviously we won't be able to do everything mammals. You guys saw me clear out a few slides at the beginning of class, for which you'll probably be very happy because it's some taxonomy. So that's now one thing we don't have to deal with. Are you actually running? I don't care. I said that I want. Oh, no, it's not menti. So, just trying to get my screen up so we can do the thing. So, uh, some of this is going to feel really familiar. As we think about what does it take, this is all I want, uh, to be a mammal, right? So we've done this a little bit like our first day of lab together, right? That was where we started. So this is going to be a nice let's come around to the end and revisit some of these big ideas. So where I actually want to start is... What are the characteristics of being a mammal? We haven't done a mentee in a while. Clearly, I was super prepared for this. I think I had it out of the software, and I can't find it this morning, so this is faster. I like faster. We like mentees, so let's just do it this way. <coughs> so let's think about... Right, we thought of a whole bunch of these at the very beginning of the semester. What does it take, or how can we tell class mammalia apart from our other classes? Okay. So when we did this in lab, we did this slightly lightly, and so now we want to focus very specifically. There are actually eight things that set our mammals apart from the other animals, right? So you want to think about these whew, as unique mammalian characteristics. And I know we're a little low today, but I know there's more than 10 of us. So humor me and let's keep working it out today, guys. All the way to the end. So let's start looking at some of the ones we have on here. Let's look at some of the biggest ones and work through what we've got. 
So fur and hair, right? These are the same, ultimately. I'm not erasing, you're rude. Those are the only ones of that I see. Our front and center. Okay, so we know that that's one. Okay, something very uniquely mammal. Okay, we have some kind of hair or modified hair on our bodies. Okay, whether it does come in the form of hair like we imagine it, fur, okay, quills, right, baleen, all of these things are forms of modified hairs. So that's a uniquely mammal thing. Okay, of course we have okay, mammary glands. Right, we can also loop any of these ones that refer to as milk on here. Okay, nipples partially. We'll give this one a partial. Right, that's also referring to milk production. Right, we know that things like our <coughs> <coughs> Have nipples, right? How do they do it? They basically sweat milk, right? But nonetheless, they're still producing it okay, via these special glands. All right, so this is a uniquely mammal thing, right? This is in fact where our namesake comes from, right? Having these special glands that produces nutrition for our offspring. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, not really going to let me connect these. Okay, we are endothermic. Okay, are we the only animals that are endothermic? Who else is endothermic? What other class is endothermic? Obvious, right? So birds also have endothermy, but they do do it differently, right? They use their metabolism differently to do it. So we're not uniquely endothermic, okay, but a bunch of physiology that we don't care about <laughs> means that the way we do do it is unique. So that's good. That works. <clears throat> okay. Teeth. Okay, so teeth is actually a good one. Now, we aren't the only animals that have teeth in general, right? Lots of animals have teeth, okay? What's special about our teeth? So this is a good answer. Why are teeth special in mammalia? Sam? Partly what they're made of. So we do have socket teeth. Are we the only ones with socket teeth, though? Not quite. So who else has socket teeth? So sharks have embedded teeth, but they're embedded in gums, not sockets, right? So when do socket teeth arise? Not long before mammals, right? So in reptilia, but not all reptiles, right? So where in reptiles do we see that? Crocodiles, right? So our archosaurs have socket teeth. So crocodiles, obbies, right? Although it's kind of hidden there. And then mammalia, okay? So what is special about our teeth? If you look at our mouth versus like a lizard mouth versus a fish mouth, what makes our teeth different? Teeth type, right? So if you look in our mouth, we have lots of different types of teeth in our mouths, right? We have teeth diversity versus if you look like inside a frog's mouth, they're all like the same type of teeth. Or like in fish's teeth, right? Remember, we learned fish teeth. We spent some time on this. But it was like one mouth, one tooth, right? But that's not the way this is, right? You have different teeth up front than you do on the sides than you do in the back. Okay. What do you do with them? Why is that? What do you use your teeth for? Chewing, right? This is the big deal with mammalian teeth. 
we have diversity because we chew our food. Okay. It seems like a silly thing to say out loud, but it's different, right? Nobody else that we've talked about up to this stage has done that, right? In fact, we've made a big deal about that. Savages don't chew their food, right? There's a lot of ways they get around that, right? We know in lab, right, birds use their gizzard to smash up their food. Right? Most of these other organisms have really fantastic ways in which they paralyze and smoosh their food up, none of which is chewing. Right? Bashing, smashing, tear tearing, whatever the case is, but they're not chewing. And some of them have really fragile teeth. Not us. Okay? Tough socket teeth that can take on whatever it is we want to eat. Okay, so let's look at a few of these oh, other ones. Oh, warm-blooded belonged in. My bad. It's like huge too. <clears throat> okay, so the other really big one on here that I see is live and placental birth. Is this one true for all our mammals? This one is not, right? So why is live birth not true? Good. So platypus in particular, all of our monotremes, so platypus and the echidnas, lay eggs, right? <clears throat> so we have a few egg layers. Just enough to make that problematic. Okay. Kaylee also mentioned things like kangaroos. <clears throat> okay, so the eggs won't have a placenta in them. And all of our metatheria, right, our pouch mammals, will also not have a placenta. So while we tend to think of most of our true mammals, you, me, cats, dogs, elephants, okay, these are all live-bearing placental mammals, okay, all of the other mammals, right, pouch mammals like kangaroos, wombats, possums, okay, and all of our egg-laying mammals, don't fall into those categories. Yep, that's not helpful, is it? Let's get, let's get rid of that. <coughs> All right. Make it stop. So here's the formal list. I have all the things that make a mammal special. So we got about half of them, okay, which makes sense, given that most of these things are, that you got are the things that we tangibly see or deal with um, with mammals on a regular basis. Okay, so we got our special endothermy, right? We got the hair slash fur, and okay, we talked about the mammary glands okay, and the milk. Okay, we talked about the teeth. Okay, remember the word hetero here? This is probably new, but hetero just means different. Okay, so it just means different dentitions. Okay, meaning we have more than one teeth type in our mouth. Okay, whereas all the other animals we talked about would be homodonts, meaning they all have one tooth type in their mouth, right? Oops. Oh, yeah, that's helpful. Good job, Dr. Annette. That one. Okay, so these are the four you guys had on the other board. Okay, now we've talked about some of these before. Okay, in passing, mind you, as we've come up through the classes. So sweat glands for a uh, example, we've mentioned in passing. So we talked about uh, cooling and being above 
right, that thermoneutral zone. We talk about some techniques that animals use to get back down or to cool themselves. And so at the time, we talked about how sweating is a uniquely mammal thing, right? Only some animals can sweat. Mammals being those animals that can sweat, right? So the implication there being we're the only animals that can sweat, so we're the only ones that have sweat glands. So we're going to spend some time being able to look at these sort of uniquely human or uniquely mammal we're going to look at human skin when we do it, but some uniquely mammal glands, and mammary glands, in fact, are some very specialized versions of sweat glands, basically. I thought kangaroos like themselves. <clears throat> kangaroos do lick themselves, in the forearms in particular, but that doesn't mean they can't sweat. Right, so that's a great example. So Kaylee has a great memory of talking about like kangaroos, for example, as well as fennec foxes, which have like the huge ears. Right, so both of these things are true. So just because a mammal has, say, sweat glands, doesn't mean it won't use some additional effective techniques to help it cool. So her example was the licking of the forearms thing. This is a really effective technique because your forearms particularly if you're horrifically pale like I am, but everybody's forearms are usually a little bit paler. So you can see the veins and arteries that you have there. And the key with why kangaroos can lick their arms is because our blood vessels come so close to the skin here. So when they lick themselves, in essence, right, getting this space wet, right, and it evaporates, the evaporative cooling here will also help cool down those blood vessels. Right, so in addition to any sweating that our kangaroo is doing, right, so evaporating cooling from its pits, right, or groin, which are normal places that we have sweat, right, areas like that, or the fennec fox, which has very large ears, so you can see the blood vessels there as well, because these animals live in such hot conditions, these additional evaporating cooling features help keep them from overheating. So in that case, both are true. Okay, and awesome memory. Okay, nice and clear. All right. So for some of these others, right, <coughs> erythrocytes are just red blood cells, right, if we've not heard that uh, word before. So we have a unique type of red blood cells to the way it's able to carry oxygen and iron. Okay, we've not talked about that before. Okay, same thing with this, uh, the Hox gene, right? The neocortex is a part of the brain. The Hox gene is a very specific um, type of gene which allows duplication, right? It's a duplicated gene in our DNA which ultimately makes it a little easier. So if you have duplicated DNA, if uh, a version of that DNA gets mutated, right, you still have the original version. So your sensory systems don't get messed up, right, you still have the original version. My nose still works, right, but the duplicated version, if it gets messed up, <clears throat> if it's messed up poorly, we still have the original version for how, say, our nose is supposed to work. But if it gets mutated in a good way, Right, then you have extra special, extra special sensory systems or an extra bonus in echolocation or whatever. Right, so because we have all this duplication, weirdly in our DNA, likely from a bigger mistake, heaven knows when, um, mutations for us tend to be less detrimental, which is cool sort of one of the luck of the draws as far as evolution goes. <clears throat> the only other thing we've really talked about before, and it's been a long time since we've mentioned this, right? Way back in the amphibians transition to land, remember, we've had one inner ear bone, right? The stapes was added. And so remember, we talked about how the ear works, right? And the stapes is one of those levels that translates in this particular case right, to physical vibrations. 
So now in only mammals do we add the other two, <clears throat> which allows for much better hearing. Right? The more bones we have in that space, the more we can amplify sound. Okay, now, some mammals still have better hearing than others, but generally speaking, this allows for really good hearing in mammals. Okay, so collectively, all eight of these things make for a list of unique characteristics that make mammals as a class special. Okay, so all three of our groups of mammals have these. Remember, well, we're not going to focus on taxonomy because time is not going to allow us to do that. There are three groups, right? We have our monotremes, right? Those are our platypus and echidnas, the egg layers, okay? And we'll hopefully get to talk about this a little bit at the end when we talk about reproduction, okay? We'll have our metatheria, right? These are our pouch animals, kangaroos, wombats, possums, right? Remember, they give live birth, but to like itty bitty babies, right? They have to grow up in the pouch. That's the point of the pouch. Okay, and then we have our eutheria, okay? Our mammal bias mammals, right? Animals that are born like us, right? Humans, cats, elephants, raccoons all of those animals. So those are born live, stay inside as long as possible, hooked up to a placenta. Okay, any questions about our list? And of course, we're going to go into some of these in more detail, okay, but certainly not all of them, and certainly even not given the time that we have. Okay, so we're going to start by talking about those glands, which is the lactation and the integument. Got to start there, right, because that's what makes a mammal, it's what's where our namesake comes from. <clears throat> we'll probably get through that here today, and then for Friday, I'm going to sift through this and pick what I think the coolest stuff is <laughs> for our final day. Um, so probably some of the reproductive, I'm going to kind of look at it and see what we want to do on our last day together, but something mammally, right? <clears throat> so let's take a look at where does the mammal's namesake come from, okay? And what are all of these glands and how are they working together? So of course our namesake is coming from this ability to produce lactation, okay? So first we're going to look at what is this? And then we're going to look at the integumentary system and look at where exactly are these glands from and how are they producing it. So this lactation process is very uniquely mammalian, right? No other animal is able to produce a material from its own body right, to produce nutrition for its offspring. Right now, birds do feed its offspring, but it's regurgitating food that it's eaten to do so. Right? This is fundamentally different, right? It's processing a unique nutritional food source from its body. Right? So we call that milk, right? <clears throat> and the key here is after the offspring is born, that this allows offspring to feed and grow, right? And this produces a lot of benefits for offspring, okay? Largely, right, growth, okay, particularly directly after birth, okay, so within the first few days to the first two weeks, right, milk is fundamentally different than any of the feeding time that occurs after that, which can sometimes, for some offspring, be years. Okay. So directly after birth in particular, it's very, very high in fat, right? even looks a little yellowy, it's called a coleostem. 
Also has more vitamins, right? and it usually switches down to being just vitamins after these first two weeks, which is where it looks a little whiter. It also has some antibodies, right? Whatever mom had, right? So whatever mom was exposed to, she passes those on as well. All right, so all of this is good for baby, right? The fatter you can make baby, the better, okay? <laughs> the more energy they will have to grow and burn off and be resilient to whenever they may be on their own or searching for food or traveling around with mom. Okay. This also provides a benefit to mom. Okay. Anytime mom is actively lactating and feeding offspring, mom is also infertile, okay. meaning she's not going to ovulate. Why is this important? So she's not using too much energy. Excellent, right? It's going to be extremely detrimental to mom if she's trying to both feed offspring, right, lactate for offspring that are already born, and, right, trying to grow new offspring, right, inside. Right? That's a lot of energy to try to duel between, okay? Right? This is so strong that in the wild, right, new males that find females that are feeding offspring will kill the offspring that they find, right, because they're not theirs. <clears throat> so, if, for example, a male lion wants to take over a pride, okay, the first thing they want to do is kill all the lion cubs, right, because they want the females to be breeding with them. Current females are not going to do that. You cannot do that. All right, so if we want the females to go back in heat, the first thing we need to do is make it so they biologically can. <clears throat> okay, excellent. So any questions about the benefits? All right, so why mammals do this? And right, so we see there's both benefits for mom and benefits for baby. All right, so now let's take a look at where is this stuff coming from? Okay, so where are these glandular outputs uh, existing? Okay, so the integument, of course, means the skin. It's the formal term for the skin. In this case, we're going to be looking at all layers of the skin to see how these gland systems work. Okay, we're going to take this holistically. So in addition to looking at our mammary glands, we're going to look at all of the glands at once to see how they kind of work in cahoots together. Mm. All right, so generally speaking, right, the integument system as a whole, right, not just necessarily for mammals, <coughs> has a big job. Okay, so we've seen this over the course of the semester. Okay, so the goal here is just attaching a formal definition to what we've been seeing. All right, so our integument, right, our skin, right, has been doing all of these things, right, some of which being pretty straightforward, right, pulls the organism together, okay. But, right, we know, right, we've seen the skin be, Right, the tough part of the organism, we've had organisms that haven't had scales, for example, so the skin's going to be the tough part. Okay. And so mechanical injuries, of course, like scraping, damaging physical stuff. Okay. We've also seen our skin be a core conversation. We talk about osmoregulation. Remember, osmoregulation is the exchange of water and gas. Okay, this was really important when we talked about our fishes, right? For the most part there, we're talking about water and salt because they were underwater. When we're above water, right, we're really talking about water, salt, and gas, right? Because we're above air, or above the water in the air. 
Okay, but again, right, this is what it's a huge portion of our body. So we're losing and gaining things through this space, evidently. These should be my bullets have fallen out. All right, so for heat, it both gathers or radiates heat, right? So we can think about our kangaroo example that we were talking about, right? They can lose heat through their skin. They're absorbing heat through their skin. All right, so we've talked about it this way as well. Okay, so most of this stuff isn't new. Okay, we just want to make sure that we're putting the definition together and we understand. We already know that our skin does a lot of stuff. All right, in addition to all this, we can stick hair in it, horns in it. When we had birds, we stuck feathers in it, we put scales on it. Okay, we can do all sorts of things to help or hinder any of these processes. Okay, I want more or less heat to get out, we can do that, right? I want more or less salt and water to get out, we can do that. But our integument system is the gatekeeper for like all of this stuff. And has been sort of since the very beginning when we were talking about sharks and fishes. Okay, so this isn't too bad, All right? Nice familiar platform. Okay, any questions about this stuff, right? So this is the nice summative segment, kind of pulling up a lot of stuff that we've been tangentially talking about. 15 weeks, 14, 50, it's usually 15, 14, I guess. So let's take a nice deep dive then into our integumentary system and how it is doing all of that stuff. Okay. So our integumentary system is broken down into three levels. Okay. One of which, as we'll find, does like the vast majority of the work. All right, so layer one, okay, the epidermis. Okay, so we have the prefix epi here. So I want to think like epi on top or outer. Okay, so this is the surface that you actually touch not necessarily the one that does everything. It's very, very thin. Okay. Generally, one of the thinnest. And so we can see that here. Okay. And overall, not a lot of stuff actually in the layer. It's a pass-through layer. Okay. So really the key with this layer is this is mostly just acting as the barrier, right? This is the saran wrap on top of whatever it is we've created, right? I want to cover everything, okay, and keep it protected, okay? Now, in addition, because it is that top layer and acting as a barrier or a cover, right, this is also going to be doing most of our osmo regulation. It has to, right? It's the thing on top. So if you're the thing on top, everything has to pass through you, okay? So when we're talking about osmoregulation, particularly for terrestrial organisms, remember most of the time we're talking about water and gas, right? Which is why your skin looks dry all the time. Uh -uh. And by the way, it's epidermis kind of boring. It protects you from mechanical damage. 
and that's kind of it. I'm going to keep everything safe that's inside. Rude. Okay, our main layer, the dermis, okay, our middle layer, okay, we see we have no prefix here. Okay, so all we have is the root word. This is where, like, most everything happens. I am your thing. Okay, so this is the biggest. Okay, and this is where we're going to find most of the stuff embedded. Okay, it is very large, and because it's so large, this is where we're getting the most cushion. And this is where most of the stuff we need, not all, but most, can be found. And certainly for the uh, sake of our class, any of the glands that we're interested in, so our mammary glands, our sweat glands, all of that stuff we're going to talk about are all embedded in this layer. All right, so this is the happening layer. Okay. In addition, most of the nerves that we're interested in, okay, we're not going to talk about them much here, but your mechanoreceptors, so things that sense touch and pressure, okay, and thermoreceptors, okay, they sense heat, are both found here as well. So we're going to end up zooming in on the dermis and focusing on our glands, right, because that's what we really care about. <clears throat> but keep in mind, remember, we – man, that's frustrating. Let's just do that for a second. Uh, that both the epidermis and dermis will be important for some of these other things that we've been talking about. So <clears> – <throat> Remember, generally speaking, that we have also mentioned that a lot, and you don't need to memorize all of these individual features, right? Key take home here. It, when we've talked about things like nails, claws, hair, etc., is these also come from the skin, right? Remember, we said the epidermis, or the integument system in general plays a big role, okay? So all of these features, some of which we've talked about, right, like nails, uh, hair, we've talked about baleen a little bit, we've talked about dentine as well, which is down from the dermis, which makes sense, because those words sound similar, all also arise straight from the integumentary system. Now, my take home here, right, epidermis being the top, most of these things are coming from the top of our skin, right? And that kind of makes sense, right? As you look at your nails, right, they look like they're coming right out of that cuticle, right, right out of that top layer. So this feels a bit intuitive to us, right? Even if you, like, I don't know if any of you guys have actually pulled or broke a nail, right, the bad kind where you know that you've taken way too much nail, Right, you can still see just mostly that top layer. We haven't even gone that deep. Right? It heals very quickly. You don't have to go to the hospital. We don't have to get stitches or anything crazy. It hurts like crap. I'm not saying it doesn't. Right? We've all lost more nail than we should. Okay, but it, it is not one of those end-of-the-world kind of injuries. Like your mom kind of like sloughs it off. You get a Band-Aid, and like the next day, everything's kind of okay. I'll get sore. So this is one of those things where we can really kind of critically reinforce how many of these things are coming out of the epidermis, right? Epi being that top, okay? And remember, our skin has so much keratin in it. This is one of our transition to land pieces, is that we needed keratin in our skin to help keep us from desiccating. And that keratin is put in and reinforced in all of these pieces, right? Our hair has keratin, our nails have keratin. So we're seeing a lot of this reinforcement. 
Okay. We're going to start by talking. I needed a slide you guys could use here. So forgive the double swipe. Talking specifically about hair and the like. It up for the right class, right? Yeah, that's working for you guys. <clears throat> so when you're done, of course, my back two rows, you are free to go. And hang in there, everybody. We are almost there. You guys not sit right here. <laughs> oh, well. it, it really doesn't. It, it doesn't matter. I think the rest of you are also welcome to go. Please have a wonderful day. I'm going online like all here because does he not, not care? It's, it's, I mean, he says something about every now and then, but he doesn't take off one for attendance, and he doesn't teach. So it's like, what am I?